TOA community, welcome back to the channel. Robert Linkle with trainingtheolderadult.com. I want to talk to you today about dealing with the loss of a friend, of a client, of a family member. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this. I have been very fortunate in my career as a trainer that, uh, let's see, I'm coming up on my 24th year as a trainer. I started in 1999. And... Uh, over that time, I have had three clients pass away. The first one was in 2010. I met a lady and trained her maybe four times. And then she found out that she had um, a tumor in her brain. And in a couple of, couple of days, she was gone. So I, I hardly, I know it's terrible. I can't, I can see her face and I just can't remember her name. Uh, it was so long ago. And um, it was a unique situation in this one because I trained her four or five times, something like that, and then she didn't show up for her sixth session. And when I called to check on her, she said, um, I need to talk to you, can you come by my house? And I was, you know, I was like, yeah, we're not, number one, I'm not supposed to do that. Number two, it was like, just felt a little uncomfortable about it, but it was the way that she said it, it was, it was very serious and sincere. And I was like, well, can I meet you like out in your driveway? Can we talk out there? And she goes, yeah. And so I, I pulled up and um, she lived right around the corner from the club. So I pulled up and she told me, she goes, hey, I'm gonna you know, cancel in my gym membership and this'll be it. Um, she wasn't gonna do treatment, et cetera. And so uh, I gave her a hug for a second and that was about it. You know, I didn't really get to know her. So that was kind of the hardest one I had all the way up until uh, 2022 when uh, my friend and client Janie passed away from cancer and um, Joyce's husband Dave uh, passed away from kind of a combo of COVID slash pneumonia slash heart disease. He was an older gentleman, you know, uh, early 80s and had a lot of uh, health issues. And so I've been working with Joyce uh, probably a year by the time Dave, well, maybe six months when Dave decided to join, he would just kind of drive her up here and just sit and watch while we trained. And then eventually he got to the point where he goes, okay, I should, I should join. So, uh, we had him, um, start, start coming in. He started getting really, you know, strong and it really started to improve his overall ability. And then as time kind of went on, he got, he got sick and, um, within, you know, two weeks he was gone. So, uh, Dave passing and then uh, Janie passing away, those were really hard. Janie and I had a very good relationship. We became very good friends. And uh, I've told the story of Janie before. It is on this YouTube channel. So if you'd like to go back and hear that story, um, I start from the very beginning. But we had a couple of really good years together pre uh, her getting ill and then through that whole process all the way down to um, some really exceptionally nice life altering things that her family, specifically her brother said about me that um, have has basically uh, altered the, the way that I feel about what I do uh, in a good way. It's when, when someone says words like that to you, if you to jump the story here, Basically, during her service, he said that uh, I was one of the angels sent to help her in this process, and that's not that's not something you take lightly when somebody says that to you. It was uh, extremely emotional for me, and it was a uh, like I said, like a life changing experience of okay, maybe I'm doing more than just helping people, you know, squat and bench press more. Um, that was really sweet, and now. Uh, with the passing of my father, uh, this is the uh, the hardest one for me. My dad and I were very, very tight. Um, we were very close friends, uh, but I mean, confidants, whatever you want to, whatever you want to name that. He was the best man at my wedding. He, you know, was my my second phone call to anything great. First one went to Keegan, second one went to my dad with whatever was going on in my life. And he was all about his career and his profession and was heavily invested in mine and uh, really wanted me to succeed and to do well. And he always had, you know, he's a marketing director, so he always had that 
marketing director mindset, the cap on of how can I help you grow and earn more customers and et cetera. He was just always thinking. So that, you know, that feeling, I mean, it's only been three days, but it's that feeling of this just happened. I finished a webinar with Hungary yesterday or with a uh, Turkey yesterday. And as soon as I got done, my first inkling was to call my dad and tell him how it went. And, and there's that moment of like, oh yeah, you know, I can't do that. I can still talk to him and tell him, but you know, it's that initial, this is what I would normally do kind of a thing, that comfort anyhow. With those processes, this article, um, I definitely think there are good ways to grieve the loss of someone and there are not so good ways. And I, I guess I would say the not so good ways would be uh, heavy indulgence into drinking or anything that was just going to make your life less valuable or less quality. Um, this is a time to grieve. It's a time to mourn. It's a time to reflect. It's a time to be with loved ones. It's a time to look internally. It's a time to ask for help and to ask for support and to rely on those around you. It's a time for all that. It's not a time um, to just drink away your sorrows or indulge in anything else that takes your mind away. It's time to be present. And really what that does by, by masking or drinking or doing anything else, it basically just pushes everything down where you don't have to deal with it, where you don't have to think about it, where you can avoid it. And that doesn't help you in the grieving process. That doesn't help you progress and move on. It actually kind of makes you stay stuck. Okay. But again, I'm no, no grieving expert. I'm going to read parts to an article, but the opportunities I've had to go through this the last couple of years, um, as soon as I saw this, I went, okay, this, this is pretty cool. And I always love some good visuals to help. So number one, now there's a bunch of these, okay, but I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of, you know, touch on each one. Okay. Attend the memorial service and say goodbye. Uh, I think that's a, a big one. I uh, loved going to Dave's service. They had a full military service for him. So his coffin, his, you know, they had the flag, they had all the pictures up of him, his medals, everything. I mean, it was so cool. Uh, he was pretty involved with the veterans um, uh, association or the, the, you know, local vet organization, uh, the, the, uh, the VA. Um, it was very cool to see that whole thing. Janie's was beautiful, the family and just everybody there and getting to socialize and chat with everyone and, and that, and, and telling stories again, we'll kind of get into that. Uh, and then with my dad, um, we're having, you know, we're going to, uh, have a service for him. We're all going to, to go to Tahoe. Um, we were, I was raised in Lake Tahoe. So we lived in, uh, in Texas, uh, then St. Louis and then Texas again. And in that whole process, my dad was working for a company called Six Flags. You may have heard of that, uh, where he was the president of a couple different parks. And he got the vice president job at Caesars Palace in Lake Tahoe. And so in 1985, go Bears, Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> uh, good year. Um, in 85, we moved to Lake Tahoe and uh, we're there all the way through, you know, me graduating high school. So I literally went to the same school district with the same 44 people in my class from kindergarten all the way up through my senior year. It was very cool, beautiful place to be raised. And on a daily basis, my dad would remind us how gorgeous it was there to never take uh, the view of the lake and the beauty and the environment around us for granted. So knowing that he, you know, enjoyed that and valued that, and we spent so many great years there, we're going to do that service up there. And we definitely will be attending and inviting all of our friends and family to that. Grieve in whatever way works for you. And then some it's, you know, having crying sessions and letting things out and others it's processing internally, but there, I will suggest that at a time, and this is where Keegan is um, so great with this. She's always making herself present with whatever I am going through. So if I need silence and just want to think, she's there and a hand on my shoulder and, you know, just reminds me that it's okay to be this way right now. And then when I want to talk and I want to tell a story or I want to talk about what's, what's going on, what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking about, she's there to listen to that too. And if, if you're listening to this 
and you're not in the grieving process, but being there for someone who is, um, that's a great time to just listen, you know, and, and a lot of times I think we want to interject our experiences and say, well, here's what worked for me, or here's what I would do, or just, just listen, just let them talk, let them tell the stories, just be good eye contact and good energy and, and just let whatever, whatever needs to occur, let that happen. Don't guide it, just be present. And for those that are grieving, wherever that conversation or that emotion takes you, go with it. This is not something that is done the right way or the wrong way. This isn't a, how do I do this kind of discussion? It's whatever, it's whatever comes out. Um, yesterday I'm getting ready to go on my ruck and when I prep, it takes me about 20 to 30 minutes to do my warm up and get all my gear on. And, you know, I got to get my water container and I get all my reflective stuff. So there's a whole process, but I watch, I put on movies, so I'm watching a movie. And I remember, uh, my dad and I having a talk about who we thought the best actor was and what scene did they really do, you know, like some exceptional work. And I had brought up um, Captain Philip, the, the Tom Hanks movie. Um, and uh, I think that's the name of it, right? Captain Phillips? Yeah. And so the very last scene, literally the last scene, he's uh, rescued from the, from the lifeboat after all the bad guys were just, you know, snipered. And he's in shock. And the, the corpsman or whatever, the, the, the medical crew, they're trying to talk to him and check him for injuries. And the acting that Tom Hanks does, uh, I may have said Tom Cruise earlier, Tom Hanks. The acting that Tom Hanks does in that scene is exceptional. You know, he can't, he can't hear her. He's kind of lost. And every time he tries to refocus, what did you say? And, and he, he, his, his hands are shaking. I mean, it's just really great. It's a three minute scene. There's no camera change. It's all one take, you know, just over the shoulder of the gal working on him. And I remember telling my dad about that. And then he watched it with me and he was like, wow, this, you're right. This is exceptional. This is a great scene. We had a whole discussion about it. Okay. So I'm getting prepped yesterday and what movie pops up on Netflix as a suggested movie for me to watch. It's Captain Phillips. And so I, of course, start to watch that. I get to that scene. And before the scene even takes off, um, you know, I remember this whole emotion, this whole discussion of my dad and I and watching it together. And um, it's a very moving scene, but I found myself, you know, really remembering that moment with my dad, not necessarily reacting to how good Tom's acting is, uh, which is great. But anyway, that's... That for me was part of my process of reflecting and pulling back on this and, and seeing uh, a scene, seeing a moment of time with my dad that helps me. I think another thing is a lot of folks might concern themselves with, you know, like, I don't want to say the person's name or I don't want to look at pictures of them. It's too painful. You need to, you know, I think you need to. You got to talk about it. You can't, you can't shy away from it because then it makes it taboo. It makes it something that's like, Every time I bring this up, I did this, many of you may not know this, sorry to go on a tangent, but my oldest brother, Richie, died of leukemia before I was born. And when I was growing up, um, obviously my, my mom, both my parents were very emotional about it, understandably. And I never really, really got that until I had a child of my own. And now, like, just the thought of that is hard. Anyway, you, you get it. So anytime I would bring up Richard Jr., Richie, Anytime I would bring him up, my mom would start crying and she would get, you know, really upset. So I got to a point where I'm like, well, I don't want to upset my mom. I'm just not going to talk about him, you know? And it became um, a taboo point, like, a, a, oh man, I'm going to, I got to stay away from this. And so it made me nervous to even discuss him or even think about him because I didn't want to set people off around me. But if we were able to have those discussions and not have that feeling with it, I think we could have talked about him on a regular basis and it would have become more comfortable. Maybe it would have been processed a different way instead of just constantly pushing it away. So I don't want people to have that experience, you know, and I, I didn't know what was happening when I was growing up. It was just, you know, what 
what happened, but I reflect on that now and go, man, I wish I, I wish I pursued that more. And maybe if I had more discussions like that with my mom, of course it would never get easier, but I think it would have helped her, you know, probably, probably process and grieve a little bit more, um, for, for his, you know, her loss and, and his loss of life. Um, that kind of leads into this one letting other people help you. You know, there's another one in here where it talks about seeing a grieving counselor and whatnot, you know, that might be it. Um, uh, there's a show on uh, Disney that Chris Hemsworth did called um, Limitless, I think is the name of it. Yeah, Limitless. And it's like a six episode series, really great show, but the very last episode is on death. And they have like a death doula and a grieving counselor and a medical team. And they kind of interview all of them and talk about what their different areas of expertise are and what they bring to the table. And you know, how they kind of help this. And so seeing someone to help go through this, you know, just, it could be a, a professional, but it could literally just be a friend or, um, you know, a colleague or somebody that you trust and, and having them hear you and then spending time with you is significant. Um, channel your feelings into creative pursuits. I, I like this, you know, I think this is something cool. Uh, there's a couple other suggestions on this one as we go, but you know, writing um, and, and maybe something artistic that you get into, like there's there's a process in that of putting your mind into something else, not necessarily to forget, but just to have your mind be busy and invested in something else while you think about this person, while you, you grieve the loss of that person. And then trying to create something positive out of your, your friend or your client or your family member's death. Um, it, it sucks, it hurts, and it's not, something that any one of us look forward to going through, but it is a real part of life. And, um, my sister said it the other day, like we have such a weird relationship with death. Like people don't want to talk about it and they find like, it's a very, I'll use that word again, taboo point that it's just like, if I don't acknowledge this as a real thing, if I don't discuss it, maybe it won't happen or maybe it, you know, it won't be present in my life. It's going to happen. It's the one thing that we are all guaranteed to have happen to us is that we're all going to die at some point and we are not guaranteed tomorrow. And that's where we need to live for the moments that are present in front of us. And, uh, you don't want to have any moments of regret. I got to say everything that I ever wanted to say to my dad. He knew exactly how I felt about him. I didn't wait till he was on his deathbed to do that. We had many discussions. We had many great talks. He knew how much I admired him. He knew how much I looked up to him. He knew what a positive impact he had on my life. He knew everything that I learned from him and was influenced by him that was good and positive. And even the ones that were not so good and positive that, uh, that from, from the simplicities of us laughing the same way to, you know, the way we would fold our socks and our underwear and, and everything in between, you know, there was, there was so much, um, that I learned was influenced by him. And I wanted him to know that. And Keegan said that to me last night too is that you want to tell people why you love them. You want to tell people why they're important to you. And you don't want to wait until that person is either gone or almost gone to say those things. So I think that's an important part of the grieving process is recognizing, you know, maybe you didn't get to say some of the things and depending on what you believe spiritually, you know, you can still say those things and, Maybe their body is not present in front of you, but their heart and their soul and their energy can be. And uh, it's never too late, you know, to put to put those thoughts into the world. Um, you, for the people that are around you uh, on a regular basis that you love and value, don't be afraid to tell them that. Um, I had some events occur in my life over the last year that made me question how I want to live and how I want to love people around me. And I think that, uh, you need to be your true self. And I think you need to let people around you know how you feel. And if you have love to give, give it. And if you have emotions and feelings that are living within you, and there's no better time than the present to let those things out.
So you have a close friend and family member around you, let them know because you never know, man. You never know what, what comes around the corner or what opportunities you might miss if you don't get to say those things in the moment. Let people know how much they mean to you. It's important. And, and I mean, think about it. If, if anyone in your life just came up and said, hey, I just want to let you know you're super important to me. I love you. I appreciate one, two, three, four, five things that you bring to my life. I hope I'm reciprocating those to you. And I love and appreciate you. You're not going to feel worse. Like you're, you're only going to feel good about that. You know, I think sharing love with people is only going to help in a world right now that it seems rather crazy with everything that's going on. Uh, you know, as the Beatles said, all we need is love. I think that was the Beatles. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, take it easy. It's true. You need some downtime. Um, sometimes it, it feels good. I, I've felt good about getting back to work, but I also kind of realize that I'm, I don't think I'm giving my hundred percent effort because my mind is somewhere else. So it is nice to take some downtime and, Take it easy and it's okay. You don't have to do everything right now and the house can be a little messy and, you know, there's, there's a, a lot to process in your mind. Um, having to keep up with the Joneses and do everything else that goes on in life, some of those things can wait, okay? Some other strategies and methods they put in here, that was the first method, those first six or seven that I just showed you, some other ones. Say their name. You know, we talked about that a bit. Uh, make sure you're saying their name and, and, and let them be a presence. This doesn't have to be, you know, something that you're worried about hiding away because you don't want to bring up these emotions. Say their name. The keepsakes, man, I love this. I, I uh, have my dad's ring, his RL uh, ring, Richard Linkle RL. Um, as my mom reminded me yesterday, it uh, works for Robert Linkle as well. Um, I do like to wear it, and uh, I had a very cool experience. The night, the day that he passed, I wore his ring, um, when I went to sleep and, uh, I dreamt about him, which was, which was really cool. That was really, um, neat. Cause I don't tend to remember my dreams. They're, they're gone almost instantly the moment I wake up. And I just remembered that I had a dream. He, my dad was there. We were trying to size the ring and I, we could not get the sizing right. And he just kept going back and forth with me. Uh, you know, I think it's still a little too loose and they would take off a little more. And it, it was just this funny process of us going back and forth. And he kept putting it on going, ah, it fits me just fine. And I'm like, well, you have these giant sausage fingers. It's going to fall off. I don't want to lose it. And we were just going back and forth. But that, and uh, I made him a, a military bracelet honoring his, uh, what I thought was eight years. The other day I said that in the video, it was actually 12 years. He had four years of uh, reserves that he had on there. And, um, and so a captain in the army, uh, I had a, a bracelet made honoring him with that. And I couldn't find that bracelet. I really wanted that bracelet. And we kind of searched all over all of his bags and everything. And I, I just, I couldn't find it. And my mom was like, I saw it just the other day. And I was like, yeah, he wore it into the gym when he came in, you know, like less than a month ago. I know it's here. It's not in a box somewhere. And I was all concerned that we lost it or misplaced it, or maybe it got, you know, lost at the hospital or something like that. And, uh, mom called yesterday and she goes, I found it. It was an, under the computer, you know, behind the monitor or something or other. And, uh, there it was. So I think those keepsakes are super important. I have some of his medals. I have some, um, you know, some, some of his shirts. I kept one of the ties that I gave him that he wore a bunch of times. And, and so it's like, I think that stuff's important. And, uh, you know, even yesterday we were boxing up some of his clothes and some of those things, just kind of getting things together, getting to process that and go through it. It's, it's an important part. Uh, this one happened almost immediately. I mean, we were literally in the, in the room as my dad passed and within, I don't know, a minute we were telling stories. My brother-in-law Renee right away started telling stories about him and he was so great through this whole process. Like my sister and I were sitting with him in the uh, emergency room and, and the doctors had pulled everybody out and just said like, you guys be with him. He's going to, I mean, they didn't say this, but they had people in there taking blood and working on stuff. And all of a sudden everybody was gone. They just pulled everybody out of there. We saw the heart rate monitor and we could see that he was starting to slip away. And, and, uh, they said like, Hey, just, 
just be with them, you know? And, and so my, my brother-in-law, Renee and Amanda and I are, are sitting there and he starts asking us, you know, what are your, what are some of your favorite memories of your dad? And, uh, as we're talking about a couple of those things, we can feel him squeezing our hands and, and being, you know, present in those memories and those moments with us. And we also had a chance in that time to, um, let some people that, that wanted to say goodbye to him, you know, say goodbye over the phone. And, uh, you know, he was very present to hear those things as well. So yeah, I think recalling memories, telling stories, I think all that is super important. It helps confirm their involvement and their value in your life, but also you might be sharing some stories that other people don't know and learn lessons, et cetera. You know, we had a great one of my dad in, in, in a trip we took to Las Vegas where we were in a rental car and he was worried, constantly worried about damaging this thing because he didn't want to pay for any damages. And we go to the hotel and we he's driving, trying to avoid the valet because he was <laughs> too cheap to pay the valet guy. So he's trying to back up and he ends up, you know, hitting these, you know, the little plastic uh, aisle markers that like bend with the car. He ends up hitting one of those. And so he turns, he's looking out the rear view and he turns to look out the window to see what damage he had done, thinking the window was open. And he turned very hard, very quick and just smacks his face into the window. And all of us start laughing. The, the, the attendants that were there, you know, the two valet guys see it. They start laughing. One guy's like keeled over laughing so hard. Dad's immediately mad, but then realizes how silly it was. And we all start to laugh. The car had a massive streak all the way down the side of it. And he had a huge golf ball, you know, sized lump on his head for the whole seven days of Vegas. It was in every photo. And that memory and that story was something that, you know, definitely lightened everybody up. So, uh, visiting, you know, sacred places, uh, or, um, you know, recreating some of their favorite practices. Uh, my dad you know, didn't have a favorite football team. He didn't have a favorite leisure activity he didn't golf. He didn't go camping. He was, he was a businessman and he loved his family. And, uh, that was about it. He liked it in here though. He loved to come into the gym. And uh, that's not a practice he did his whole life, but the, at the very end here, we had a good two years every Wednesday together. You know that book, Tuesdays with Maury? I think I'm gonna do a book called Wednesdays with Richard. Uh, I thought would be you know, kind of fun uh, to talk about some of the things my dad and I talked about. And, and the very cool part is I have video of him from pretty much every single workout along the way, um, which I, I think will be you know, something that I recall for a teaching tool and progressions, but also just how fondly watching his growth and his ability to improve at a late stage in life. It was never too late for him to get better. Scrapbooks, you know, making scrapbooks, reflecting pictures and just getting that, that um, time frame. I think that's what's awesome about digital media and, and our social media is, is like Facebook basically is a timeline of all the events that have happened in your life. And so I've got you know, 10 plus years of my life, if not more. I don't remember when I got on Facebook, 2009, somewhere in there, maybe earlier. So, I mean, we've got 15 years, if not somewhere around in there of documented life from where our kids were born to, you know, every vacation and every event we hosted and all this, it's very cool to go back. And then Facebook will remind you, oh, here's this memory that, you know, uh, that was big. Like a lot of that, we, I see my dad in the process is where he's 330 pounds and, you know, just really unhealthy falls and breaks his hip. And then, you know, you fast forward to 2022, he's 180 pounds and, um, so much happier and healthier and his body's way less stressed, you know? And, and, and so you can kind of see those timelines. We do, you know, a pretty good job with social media, maybe obsessed with our phones a bit, but uh, pretty cool to be able to see some of that on there and then do something cool in their honor. You know, we're thinking about doing something in dad's honor, uh, maybe on an annual, you know, thing either on father's day or on his birthday or on veterans day or something, something that, um, you know, will give us a, I don't know, like a, a rucking for Richard or rucking with Richard or, or something that, you know, could be, um, a yearly event that reminds me of dad and takes me through, um, a connecting opportunity with him. And then, you know, sticking to your routine. We talked about that a little bit. Like, you know, you got, we can't just sit in darkness all day and be sad. You got to, you know, keep up kids and we still got to 
do our regular stuff, still got to make videos, still got to, you know, get on with life here. So that is important. But, you know, in the same time, you got to, you got to go through this grieving process. Redefining yourself. I thought this was really cool. I wanted to read this to you. This, as I was starting my presentation yesterday, um, my friend Engine, who is the, the head teacher at the university in Turkey that I present for, he, he said this to me. Um, he said, Robert, your dad must have been a great man to have made a son like you. His love and energy now travels on to you and you live with him alongside you. We believe this to be true, our dear friend Robert. I thought that was very, very cool. Uh, it was really good to hear. I was live on camera with you know 30 students and tried not to let my emotions get the best of me in that moment. But hearing that, um, you know, that's true. We we do get to live for the people that have influenced us and affected us, and we are going to continue on and carry on. And uh, there's a huge part of my dad that I will carry with me always. And I, I will always feel him, you know, alongside me, supporting me, encouraging me. He taught me so much. So it's, uh, he will be involved in everything. But as I continue to this new pursuit, I am redefining myself a little bit now with the loss of my dad physically, but now uh, absorbing his energy and love for life and connections he had with people. He was such a good, genuine human being to people. I want to adopt more of that into my life and, and have that be a, a, a component that, you know, I redefine a little bit of, of being that good, loving, genuine person that my dad is and was and being able to adopt more of that into my life. I always try to treat everybody with the utmost respect and exactly how I would want to be treated, if not, if not better. And he lived that, you know, to a pretty good extent. So I love that. Spend time with supported, uh, with su spend time and, and be loved by those who support you. I think that's important. It's like sending your energy out, but let it come back to you. Let it come back to you. Let people bring you food. Let people love you. Let, let energy in. You need it. Okay. You need it. Um, and then this was the last one, you know, you talk to a grief counselor if, if needed, uh, I think if you get to a point where you're like, Hey, a lot of these other things maybe aren't working all that well. Uh, I need some professional help. I think it's a good thing. I will tell you this sitting here for the last 32 minutes, sharing what I just shared, talking about this has helped me immensely. And if you've made it this deep into the video, um, number one, thank you. Thank you for listening to this. And, uh, I hope it helps in a little bit of a way. Again, I'm, I'm not a grief counselor. I'm just giving you experience from my life and what uh, has definitely helped me, what is currently helping me. And there's something to be learned in life. There's something to be learned in death. And if anything, my resolve for why I want to help people with what I do, my pursuit to help battle sarcopenia and uh, to help people improve, if anything, my dad, who had, you know, a laundry list of things wrong with him, but the hardest and the most difficult one was dialysis uh, for kidney failure and just severe under muscle, just severely deconditioned, you know, to watch him with, with one workout a week and some home, homework that he would practice on, on occasion. To see him make the physical transformation that he changed has just strengthened my resolve for what I do, has strengthened my pursuit in this mission to try to insert this mindset to people that with something as simple as twice a week for 20 minutes or once a week for an hour, as my dad showed, that drastic changes, drastic changes can occur in your life, okay? You can improve your quality of life so much. This man was almost wheelchair bound, using a walker, could barely stand up straight. And I'm not going to say it was all because of what we did in here, but it had a large chunk to do with that. And if, if I could help that man do this, I know that all of us other trainers, all of us other coaches, we can all have such a positive influence and impact on those around us. That's why I make these videos. That's why we do TOA Select is that, you know, I could probably have 100 to 150 clients that I work with on a regular basis. 
but that would be the limit of my capacity of people that I could reach and try to share this with. So I make this effort, Keegan and I make this effort to put out more of this content to teach other trainers, hopefully hundreds if not thousands of other trainers, okay, if we can reach them and teach them the value of resistance training and implementing in specific ways for the aging body and have them positively influence their 100 or 50 clients, then now we're talking about thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, I hope, fingers crossed, people that we can positively influence. The simplicities of sit to stands and rows all the way up to the advanced eight week progressions and volumes and reps and sets and all this. I wanna share it all, I wanna teach it all. Anecdotal practices we have in here, the research that we find that connects it, vice versa. I just wanna share it and I hope that it has a positive impact somewhere. Thank you for watching. Comments or questions, if you wanna share this video, please, please do. And uh, for all those that have left messages that have posted um, regarding my dad, thank you for sharing those. Perfect strangers who said they were influenced by him and watching his journey on our Instagram page, that kind of thing, that meant a lot. It means a lot. And um, thank you for reinforcing and sharing that what we're trying to do and why I wanted to share his story, it's working. Much love to all of you. Thank you so much. And please continue to fight your good fight against sarcopenia. Take care.